was 24 years ago this weekend that Chris and I and our little family took a step of faith and followed the Lord and started Woodlands Church. Now, we had no members, no place to meet, very little resources, but we gathered 15 people in a home in the Woodlands, and we said, this is the beginning of a church that would kick religion out the door. Because Jesus Christ died, and he rose again, not to start a religion, but to start a relationship with you, because he loves you so much. And Jesus plus nothing equals everything, and it's all about a relationship with Christ. And that's what the church will be about. And 24 years later, a lot of people ask us, could you have ever imagined back then what the church has become? Does it surprise you what this church has become from those small beginnings? And I would have to say, yes, God always surprises us. God always does more than we could ever ask, think, dream, or imagine in our lives. But I also have to say that we knew we had a great God who wanted to do great things in our lives and in our church. And so... Yes, we're surprised, but that's not been a real big surprise because God is a real big God, and he can do whatever he wants to do in our lives. And so we've seen God do big things, but really, Chris and I feel so strongly this is just the beginning of Woodland Church. We feel like that God has been preparing the church for 24 years and building a foundation so that now we can make a difference beyond measure with God's grace and power. To help heal this hurting world from the woodlands to the world we say and so we just really believe that God is just getting started and what he really wants to do all this has been preparation for God's purpose for our church for your life and so you know that's not really that surprising what God has done but I have to say what has surprised us the most over the last 24 years the thing that we're surprised the most by is that God is never surprised. That's what surprises me the most. God is never surprised. Now, don't get me wrong. We know the Bible teaches that God knows the future. And, of course, God is never surprised because he's all-knowing, and theologians call this God's omniscience, that he knows everything. So, of course, he knows the future, and he's not surprised by the future. I knew that in my head 24 years ago. But now I know it in my heart because... Each time we hit a problem that came from out of the blue, each time we slammed into a barrier that we had no idea was on the way, each time we were blindsided by a hurt, pain, or loss that just came into our lives when we never expected it to, every time we ran into a dead end that we just didn't see coming. As I look back on it now, I can see that none of it surprised God. It always surprised me. It always caught me by surprise, but it didn't surprise God. It was all part of God's plan, and dead ends don't surprise God. And dead ends don't destroy God's purpose for your life. They're just part of the plan because God brings you to a dead end, and it's just the step before deliverance. It's just the step before the miracle. Many times in your life, God will bring you to the place of dead end to get you to trust him so that he can take you to that very next step, your destiny. And we've seen it over and over again. Nothing surprises God. And that is so comforting to know. That's why we're in this series we're calling God's Standard Time, GST. And we said that God's Standard Time is very different from our time frame. God never tries to coordinate with our calendar. God's standard time is different from our time. And God's standard time is always perfect. God is never early. God is never late. He is always on time. It's just that many times we can't see it at the time. Because all we can see is the here and now. Because we as human beings are limited by time and space. And our time is limited. But God, on the other hand, he created time and space. And he stands outside of time and space, and he rules over it. He's not limited by time and space, so he's in the past, present, and future all at the same time. God is never surprised because he knows the future, and he's already there. And that's so comforting to know. So I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. And we're going to look at our key passage where God speaks to the prophet, but he also wants to speak to us today. 
So would you stand in honor of God's word, Woodland Church, and I want to welcome every one of you worshiping with us at our satellite campuses and everyone worshiping with us wherever you are in the world through our broadcast ministry. We love you. I know God has a plan for your life. I know God knows where you're at, and God cares, and he has the power to do something about it. So from the Woodlands to the world, we're one church built on God's word. So here's a word from the Lord for you today. Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God, and there is none like me. Only I can tell the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. Dear God, I thank you that your standard time is the only time that really matters, and your timing is always perfect. It's just that I can't always see it at the time. But all I can see is the here and now, and sometimes it looks like you're not coming through. And sometimes it looks like I'm at a dead end, and, and I can't see that deliverance is just around the corner. And it's just part of your plan. So I, I pray today that you would help us learn to trust you, that we can trust you with our future. And even though we don't know what the future holds, we know who holds the future. You are already there, and we thank you, Lord, that you have a good plan for each and every one of us. And we thank you, Lord, that you don't want us to miss out on that plan. So help us synchronize our hearts to your time, to experience all that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated, and I want you to underline the phrase in our key passage. Only I can tell you the future before it happens. God is the only one who can tell the future because he's already there. God is already in the future. So he's the only one who knows the future. Now, there are futurologists today, people whose jobs actually get paid to look at social science and analytics and technology and make predictions about the future. And sometimes they get it right, but most of the time they're really wrong. And then you have fortune tellers and psychics and mediums that try to tell the future. And every once in a while they get one right and people are so impressed. But even a broken clock is right twice a day. But God's standard time, he's right every second of every day through all eternity. And so, you know, I mean, sometimes futurologists... And these future scientists get some things right in their predictions. And sometimes psychics get something right in their predictions. But most of the time they're really wrong. And then you have the so-called experts, the talking heads, the political experts, the sports experts who are always making predictions. And every once in a while they get one right. But most of the time they're really wrong. And now, I have to give Sports Illustrated credit because back in 2014, they predicted the Astros would win the World Series in 2017. And they came out with this cover. In June of 2014, and actually put George Springer, the MVP of the World Series, on the cover three years ago after the Astros had lost 100 games. They predicted they would win the World Series in 2017. And now they just came out with a commemorative collector's edition for uh, 2017. And there's Springer hitting home run in the World Series. And it says, baseball's great prophecy. So they're bragging on themselves. But before you think Sports Illustrated covers have this prophetic power, you need to look at it as a whole because Sports Illustrated has got it wrong so many times. There's even something called the Sports Illustrated cover curse. Because so many times when they put a team on the cover, they start doing terrible. You know, so many times when they say this team could be the greatest of all time, then the team falls apart and or a star player gets hurt and... And so they get it wrong so many times, it's called the Sports Illustrated Cover Curse. And before you think the Astros broke the Sports Illustrated Cover Curse, you might want to ask the Dodgers about this cover from just a few issues ago that said this, best team ever? Apparently, they're not the best team this year. So... They made an argument that they were the best team of all time in Major League Baseball history. And they were a great team, but they weren't even the best team this year. And so I don't think the Dodgers think the Sports Illustrated cover curse is broken. So they get it wrong a lot of the time. Only God knows the future. And God is never surprised. God never learns. God 
never has to learn anything. He never discovers anything new that he doesn't already know. God never asks questions unless he's asking questions from his children to draw a response out of them, to teach them a lesson. Because God never learns, he just teaches. Just like he did Abraham in the Old Testament when God gave Abraham this visual lesson of what he wanted to do in Abraham's future. It says in Genesis 15, verse 5, He, God, took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. So God was going to tell Abraham about this amazing, great plan that he had for his future. But he knew first that he had to get rid of Abraham's ceiling. He had to get rid of the ceiling that Abraham had placed upon God and what he thought God could do in his future. He knew that Abraham wouldn't believe it unless he got rid of Abraham's ceiling. So Abraham had been staring at the ceiling of his tent for so long that he started to put a ceiling on what God could do in his life. And so God had to take him outside of his tent and he said, look up at the night sky. And God gave him an assignment. He said, Abraham, I want you to count the stars and the night sky. And I can just imagine Abraham says, okay, and he starts counting. And then God comes back a couple of hours later, and Abraham saying 2,432, 2,433, 2,433. God, this is impossible. Do I have to keep doing this? And God says, that's the point. It is impossible. And I just want to remind you, I'm the one that created those stars and put them in space. And you can't even count all the visible stars in the night sky. And I just wanted to remind you of how big and powerful I am before I tell you how great and powerful the future is that I have planned for you. Before I tell you my great plan for your future, you'd never believe me unless you stop to remember how great and powerful I am. Until you take the ceiling off of what you think I can do in your life. See, our greatest problem in life is we make God small. We try to make ourselves too big. We try to fit God into our own little image of who we think he is or who we want him to be rather than discovering who God really is and letting God be God in our lives. We try to fit God into our own little box of understanding. And it's sort of like trying to pour the ocean of God into the teacups of our little brains. It just doesn't work. And instead of letting God be God, we put a ceiling on what God can do in our lives. We try to tame God to make him small, safe, harmless. But the creator of the cosmos will not be tamed. He will not be made small. God will be God. He cannot be tamed. He cannot be contained. For he is all-powerful God. Hey, and by the way, if you look at the stars in the night sky on a clear night out in the country... Like Abraham, where there's no electricity, no lights. Looking up, did you know there are 70,000 million million visible stars in the night sky on a clear night with no lights around? 70,000 million million. That's 70 with 22 zeros behind it. That is more stars visible in the night sky than the grains of sand on all the beaches on earth. No wonder Abraham had a problem with this assignment. No wonder he flunked. And God did that on purpose. He said, Abraham, you can't count all the stars that I've created in this infinite universe. And I just want you to remember that before I tell you my great plan for your life. So that maybe you'll believe it. And so I want to really boil it all down today with one question. Why can I trust God with my future? And it really all comes down to a little prayer that... I learned as a kid that I would pray before meals. As my parents taught me, and I taught my kids, and now grandkids, to say your blessing. And I would fold my hands, and then I would peek all through the blessing. And then I would say to my brother, you peeked during the blessing. And I really called him out. I got him on it, you know. And my parents would say, how did you know? Just because I was in tune with God. You know, that's how I'm there. No. You know, And you pray that little prayer, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. I want to change it just a little. God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our future. And if you remember those three things, then you're going to synchronize your heart with God time. 
and you're going to align your future to the great future that God has planned. And so let's look at it. First, I need to realize God is great. God loves it when his children believe him for great things in our lives. After God took the ceiling off and Abraham realized that there's no ceiling on God, and he began to count the night stars, God said, you can't count all the stars in the visible night sky, Abraham. And I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. Your descendants are going to be so numerous, you won't be able to count them. Just like you can't count the stars or the grains of sand on the seashore, you will not be able to count your descendants. You're going to be the father of a great nation, and there will be so many descendants, millions upon millions, you won't even be able to count them all. That's my plan for your future. And in Genesis 15, 6, it says, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. So Abraham believed what God said. He didn't understand it all. He didn't have a clue, but he just knew God told him to be the father of a great nation. You won't be able to count all the descendants. And he believed God. In Jeremiah 32, 17, it says, O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Underline that phrase, nothing is too hard for you. So what impossible situation are you facing today? What dead end have you slammed into that you weren't expecting? It totally blindsided you. There's nothing impossible with God. And a dead end is not really a dead end to God. It's just the place right before your destiny. God will bring you to dead ends over and over again in life. And it's just part of God's plan. And if you're at a dead end in some area of your life, just know this. You're at X marks the spot. You're at the place for a miracle. God works his miracles at the place of dead end when he gets you to the place where you realize it has to be God. Then he gets all the credit. Dead end is that one step before your destiny. So if you're at a place of dead end, you're at X marks the spot for a miracle in your life. It just doesn't feel like it right now because it feels like a surprise. You've been blindsided. Didn't surprise God. It's just part of his plan. And God is great. And nothing is impossible with God. So what ceiling have you placed on God? There's several ceilings we typically place on God. First is the ceiling of boredom. We think if I surrender my life totally to God, then he's going to make me miserable. He's going to mess up my life. He's going to steal all my fun. Nothing can be further from the truth. Abraham's life up until this point had been really boring. But then he aligned himself with God's plan and the great adventure began. I cannot promise you if you follow God with all your heart, it will always be safe. I can't promise you if you follow God with all your heart that it'll never be wild and stressful and frightening. I can't promise you if you follow God with all your heart that you won't experience problems and pain. But I can guarantee you one thing. I guarantee you it will never be boring. Following the untamed God has been the greatest adventure of my life. And looking back on the last 24 years, Chris and I would say it's been amazing. Awe-inspiring, exhilarating, frightening, painful, wonderful. But one thing it has never been is boring. Following the wild, untamed, uncontrollable God is the greatest adventure of your life. But we put the ceiling of boredom on God. And then we put the ceiling of fear. I'm sure Abraham had his fears about what God was going to do next. If he totally surrendered to God's plan for his life. But he didn't let his fear stop him from following God. And I have to admit, I'm a mixed bag of fear and faith, of trust and doubt. But I'm learning not to let my fears keep me from following God with all my heart. People ask Chris and I a lot, are you ever afraid as you step out in faith? Because at Woodland Church, we step out in faith more every year. Because when God builds your faith... He helps you take bigger steps of faith. And so we're stepping out, stretching. We're stepping out in faith, believing God for more than we've ever believed him for to meet the needs of hurting people. And as we step out in faith and we trust God, you know, sometimes people say, well, how do you have so much faith? I mean, do you ever afraid? And I say, I'm afraid every single day. I have fears every single day. But I've learned not to let my fears keep this church from following God with all our heart. And we take steps of faith. God doesn't say take a leap of faith, just a step of faith. When he asks you, you take that step of faith in spite of your fears. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is 
taking a step of faith in spite of your feelings of fear. Because you can't help it when fears come into your life. You can't help it when you have a worried thought. It's what you do with it that makes all the difference. You get to choose that. And so just because you have feelings of fear, if you're going to try to work out all your fears before you take a step of faith, you will never take a step of faith. And that's why most people never really fulfill the dreams that God has placed upon their heart. They're always trying to work out every little detail before they take a step of faith. You take a step of faith and God opens a door. Then he says, take this next step and then God opens another door. And that's the way God works. If you try to work out your future and plan it all out, you're just going to make God laugh. If you ever want to make God laugh, tell him your plans for the future. Simple as that. You know, the Christian life is purposeful, but it's never predictable. But God knows. God has that purpose, and God has that plan. So you take a step. Some of you need to trust Christ and give your life to Christ, but you're a little afraid maybe he'll make you into a religious nut, or, or he'll take away all your fun, or he'll, he'll, you're just worried about what will have you give up. And all you have to do is take a step of faith and surrender your life to him. And then he takes it and gives you the strength to take the next step and the next step. Don't let your fears keep you from the greatest decision, most important decision of your life as your eternal destiny is at stake. Some of you need to be baptized to show that you love Jesus, that he's in your life. You've never been baptized. And so you need to be baptized. But I don't know. I'm a little uncomfortable about that, getting my hair wet and all. And You just got to take that step. Take that step of faith. If you're trying to work out all your fears and understand everything before you take a step of faith, you will never experience the great adventure of the Christian life that God has called you to. You take a step of faith. Some of you, you know you need to tithe that God's word says it, to put God first in your finances, to give the first 10% back to him so he can bless the rest and, and that he's first place in your finances. But, but you're afraid, well, if I do that, it's God really going to come through. I don't know if God's really, his promises are really true and and you're just not sure. You just wish you could work it all out and figure it all out. And that's why God says give the, the first and best, not the leftovers. Because he wants you to have faith. And, but you don't have to be fearless. You're going to have fears. But you step in faith and then God takes care of the rest. It's the way it always works. Don't let your fears keep you from taking steps of faith. But then there's the ceiling of assumptions. And this may be the worst. We make assumptions about God and ourselves and then we never question them. According to the research of Rolf Smith, children ask on average 125 probing questions every day. And if, if you have little kids, then you know they ask those questions. Why do we do this? Why do we do that? What is this? Why is that? There's a question after question after question. But they found in this research, as adults, we only ask about six probing questions a day. So somewhere between childhood and adulthood, we lost 119 questions. We just start making assumptions about ourselves and about God and, and others, and we just accept those false assumptions. We put the ceiling of assumptions upon God, and we stop challenging those assumptions. We start staring at the ceilings in our life. We make too many assumptions about what is and isn't possible in our lives. Abraham was told to be the father of a great nation and have millions upon millions of descendants, and yet he was 100 years old, and his wife Sarah and never had a child. She was barren, and so he was too old. I mean, that was the assumption. He's just too old. There's no way God can do something great. He's just too old. And sometimes people say, well, I'm too old for God to use me, or I'm too young for God to use me, or I'm not spiritual enough for God to use me, or I'm not talented enough for God to use me. Um, I don't have the resources like others have for God to use me. It's just on and on. And we, we make these assumptions about ourselves and about God, and we just limit everything God wants to do in our lives. But if there's one thing we've learned at Woodland Church over 24 years is that God uses ordinary and perfect people. Because that's all he has to work with. You know, we look at Scripture and we think, oh, those were extraordinary men and women of God. Extraordinary, perfect men and women of God. No. They were ordinary, imperfect people like you and me. God has always used ordinary, imperfect people. Because that's all there is, folks. Think about in Scripture. Gideon was so insecure and had such low self-worth, he was filled with fear. We see that Jonah ran from God. David committed adultery. Peter denied Christ. Miriam, she was a gossip. And we see that Martha was a worrier, worrywart, constantly worrying. Thomas was a doubter. Zacchaeus, he was a cheater. And Elijah he was depressed. 
Moses stuttered. Abraham was too old. Samuel was too young. Lazarus was too dead for God to use him. But God still used him. So what's your excuse? It's always an excuse. It's really just an assumption that we make and we don't question those assumptions. And we try to limit God. In Proverbs 19, 21, it says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. See, sometimes we assume we know exactly what God's plan is, or we make our own little plan, and we say, God, come over and bless. It's a really good plan. You're, you're going to love it. It really involves, you know, good things, and it's a great plan. I'm going to do this for you, God. And God, could you come over and stamp your approval on it? And God says, it's not my plan. But if you'll come over and join the plan I have for you and align and synchronize your heart to my clock, then I'll blow your plan out of the water. See, with God, all things are possible, but nothing is predictable. God does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. He's God, I'm not. And I have to say, God, you are great. You know the future, you're already there, and you want to do something great in my life. But then I can trust God and my future to God because not only is God great, but God is good. God is great, God is good. God's not only great, but he also cares about every detail of my life. In Psalm 8, 3, it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. The psalmist is saying, God, it just blows me away to think about the fact that you, the creator of the cosmos, care about every detail of my life. God, you're great. God, you're good. You care about every detail of my life. Now, we're always trying to make God small and limit God. And God says, I will not be made small by you. I am God. I can't be contained. I can't be limited. I'm not going to allow you to make me small because I've chosen to make myself small. He chose to make himself small. And he came as a baby that first Christmas to experience all that we go through, to show us that he cares about everything that we go through. It's amazing. The creator of the universe, the great, powerful creator of the universe chose to make himself so small as a tiny baby to show that he cares about every detail of our lives. So grateful for that. So there's no problem in my life that is too big for God to handle it, and there's no problem too small that God doesn't care about it. For you see, if God was just great and all-powerful, but he didn't really care about my life, there's no need to pray. But if God really cared about everything you're going through, but he's not powerful, there's no need to pray because he can't do anything about it. But because God is great and God is good, we're to pray about everything because he cares about everything in our lives. But then I want you to see the third thing. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our future. We have to thank him in advance. See, the big problem is I want to know every detail about my future before I say yes to it. I want God to tell me every detail about the plan, and then I'll decide if I want to do it or not. And God says, if you'll just say yes because you trust me and take a step of faith, then I'll reveal more about your future, and I will guide you to the right path because I know the future. I'm already there. Corey Ten Boom said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. We don't know the future, but we know who holds the future, and we can trust him and align ourselves with his plan. But we want to know every detail of the plan, and God says, no, just say yes and trust me because I'm great and I'm good. In Romans 4.20, it says, but Abraham never doubted. He believed God for his faith and trust grew ever stronger. And he praised God for this blessing even before it happened. Underline that phrase, even before it happened. Abraham thanked God for fulfilling the promise even before it happened. He said, God, I don't have to understand it all. I don't really understand it all but I thank you that you're going to come through. And there are times when you're at a dead end and you don't see what God is up to. And if you just say, God, I don't get it. I don't, I, I'm totally blindsided by this. I, I never expected this. I don't like it. This stinks. I don't understand it. But you're God and I'm not. And I thank you in advance that this place of dead end is just the last step before deliverance. 
that you have me at this place because you're just getting ready to open this door and work a miracle. So thank you, even though I don't feel like thanking you. Thank you. And you thank God in advance, and that's faith. Thank him for the future in advance. And then how do I really do that with my life, thanking him in advance with my life? First, obey God even when I don't understand it. We're always wanting to understand everything. God really explained it all to me, then maybe I'll do it. And God says, you take a step of faith and obey, and then I'll come through. Hebrews 11.8 says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Now, Abraham lived in Ur of the Chaldees. It's modern-day Iraq. And then God comes to him and says, Abraham, I want you to pack up all your belongings, pack up all your family, and I want you to go to a place that I've picked out for you that's the promised land. It's your inheritance. And I'm sure Abraham said, that's great, God. Now, where is it? And God says, don't worry about that. I'll just tell you when to stop. You just head out. I'll tell you when to stop. And he goes. Abraham was going without knowing where he was going. Have you ever been in that place where you're going without knowing? You just know God's called you to do it, but you don't know where it's all going to end. And that's the way God works. You take a step of faith, he opens a door. Step of faith, he opens a door. And too many times we want to go, God, just tell me every little thing. And then I'll decide if I do it. And we miss out on God's best for, her, for our lives. So God says, I want you to obey. Even when you don't understand it all, take a step of faith. And then I thank him in advance when I give to God, even when I don't have it. When I give, even when I don't have it. To thank God in advance, I have to have thanksgiving because thanks and giving always goes together. But thanks and giving are always one and the same. Genesis 14, 20 says, And praise be to God, most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So God taught Abraham the principle of tithing, giving the first 10% back of all God's blessings to show that God's first place. And the reason this is so important is because the greatest fears we have about the future and the greatest struggle we have in trusting God about our future are financial fears. You know, what's going to happen to the stock market? What about retirement? What about this? What about that? What about the job uncertainty? What about? And so it's our financial fears that are our greatest fears about the future. And when you put God first in your finances and not last, then you don't have to worry anymore. Because God says, I'll meet your needs. I'll meet your needs. Not your greeds, but I'll meet your needs. I'll come through for you. And you can see me come through for you. You can learn to trust me. It's good to plan financially. It's good to do all those important things the Bible talks about, saving and getting out of debt and budgeting, real important biblical principles. But the first and most important is to put God first. Because then that takes all the worries away because God's involved. And God says, I'll meet your needs no matter what happens. And then I trust God even when I don't see it. Even when I can't see what God's doing at a dead end, I have to trust him. It may seem like he's not coming through, but God's plan is being executed, and God and his timing is always perfect. He's never late. Hebrews 11 says, he was too old to have children, and Sarah could not have children. It was by faith that Abraham was made able to become a father because he trusted God to do what he had promised. The man was so old, he was almost dead. But from him came as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. Like the sand on the seashore, they could not be counted. Abraham came to a dead end. He was 100 years old. And Sarah was in her 90s and was barren. It looked impossible. It was a complete dead end. But it wasn't a dead end to God. It was just that step before deliverance. It was just that step before their destiny. And God is not surprised by the dead end you're facing. Dead ends never surprise God. And if you're at a dead end right now, and some of you are, you're at this place of dead end where you feel like There's no more hope. Or maybe in your marriage, it's a dead end. Or in your career, you're at a dead end. Or in your health, there's a dead end. And and you're just feeling like that all hope is gone. You know, we said last week that God created time and space. He created the universe from nothing. He created something out of nothing. Now, we human beings have to have something in order to which to create from. We're, We're very creative, human beings are. But we have to have materials with which to create. But God, on the other hand, he doesn't need anything in order to create. He creates something out of nothing. And so when you're down to the fact that there's no time left, God can create time where there's no time. 
when there's no hope, God can create hope where there's no hope. Where there's no love, God can create love where there's no love. God can create life where there's no life. And so God, the creator of time and space, can create something out of nothing. And that's why we can trust him with our future because that dead end didn't surprise God. And that dead end will never destroy God's purpose for your life. The first time we hit a dead end that blindsided me was at our second service when those 15 people were so excited about the first service, only eight of them came back the next week. We would lost half the congregation in a week, and I did not see that coming. And I'm not great at math, but I could do that trend. A few analytics there. It's like, okay, we lost half the congregation in a week. That means we have one more week, and we lose the rest if it keeps going to this trend. It was a dead end. But, you know, we, Chris and I and our little preschoolers went to Galveston for a day just to clear our heads and to pray. And as they were building sandcastles and we looked out over the water and the power of the ocean, the immenseness of the ocean and the waves crashing in, it just reminded us how big and great God is. And it's God's church. You know, thank you, Lord. God is great and God is good. And we thanked him for our future because it was in his hands. And that's what God wants you to do right now. And we've hit so many dead ends so many times. And they surprise me every time. It's like, God, did you know that was coming? Didn't see that from out of the blue. God, yeah, that didn't surprise me. Sometimes they're dead ends that I create. And sometimes they're dead ends that God moves me into and pushes me into. But it's all for his purpose and his plan. And if you're at a dead end, what you need to do is pray and say, God, do it again. Deliver me again. God, do it again. I don't see it right now, but you do. Do it again. And we've seen God come through over and over and over again. He'll bring you to dead ends over and over in your life. But it didn't surprise him. And he wants to do a great work in your life. And I don't know what dead end you're at. I don't know where you are. Maybe you're on the other side of the world, sitting in your living room. Or you're right here in the woodlands. But I know this. God hears your prayers. Because God is great and God is good. And thank him for your future. And and just say, God, I need you to do it again. Deliver me again. And you get all the credit. God, do it again in my life. I know that you can. I look back over my life and see you've come through. I need you to do it again. And you get ready for God to work a miracle in your life. Let's bow together and let's just thank Him. Dear God, we come before you and we just thank you that dead ends don't destroy your purpose. And I pray for everyone who's at a dead end that you would just fill them with your peace right now. That you're going to destroy that dead end. That you're going to just blow up that barrier and rebuild it into a bridge that will take them to their destiny. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we're right in the middle of your plan and your purpose that cannot be thwarted. But Lord, do help us synchronize our hearts to your time, to trust you, to take steps of faith that you call us to take, to not miss out on your purpose and plan. And I pray for those at dead ends that you would just work miracles this week and you would let them know it's all you and they'd give you all the glory and all the praise. And Lord, we just pray for those who've never received you, that they've never really experienced what it means to really know you, Jesus. They know about you, but they don't know you. And I pray right now that they would just say this prayer in the silence of this moment. Even though, Lord, they can't say, do it again, Lord, they can say, Lord, come into my life for the first time. Forgive me of all my sins, Jesus Christ, and make me new. Give me a fresh start. Be the Lord of my life and take me on your path. I'm tired of trying to do it myself. I need you and your forgiveness and your grace and your salvation and you to take me to heaven. So I ask you to save me. Thank you for saving me. Now help me grow in my faith. In Jesus' name, amen.